you don't know the world you're living in. Welcome to the future. Welcome everybody to the first episode of the podcast. I am the gadfly sent by God to rouse you Athenian men from your slumber into an examined life. Let's begin. Is the earth flat? The obvious answer is no, and you're an idiot if you say otherwise. How could the earth be flat when the scientists and the textbooks all agree with the images and the mathematical models so coherently to give us the spherical earth we know today? The science is settled. Let's move on. Such responses are incredibly common, and they are as unscientific as a witch doctor channeling spirits of his ancient ancestors. Philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce, who was a scientist, a lecturer at Harvard, and is considered to be the founder of modern logic and semiotics, called this method of fixing one's belief the method of authority, which we might more simply call the fallacy of the appeal to authority. Questioning if the earth is flat might seem like a waste of time because the science is settled and the evidence exists to prove otherwise. The problem is that true science is never settled, no matter how strong the evidence. This is according to philosopher Karl Popper, who suggested that science is falsifiability. C.S. Peirce and William James would be just a few other professional philosophers of science who comfortably fit into the camp of those who believe that science is a never-ending process of inquiry. On that note, let's understand how these men thought science does what it does. First, in order for a claim to be scientific and not pseudo-scientific, it has to be able to be proven wrong or falsified. So the scientific method under this model would formulate a hypothesis, and an experiment would then be devised to prove that hypothesis wrong. If the hypothesis was proven wrong, then we could say that it's not a valid contender and that it had been falsified. End of the line. Back to the drawing board. But if it had not been falsified, we would not conclude that our hypothesis is proven, but only conclude that it has not been disproven. And when we make several legitimate, wholehearted attempts to falsify our hypothesis, and hopefully when other members of our community join in and try to prove us wrong, yet nobody can disprove it, then we call our hypothesis a theory. Meaning, it's never been proven wrong, but still has never been proven correct. It's just really good at avoiding death by evidence. A scientific theory cannot be proven correct if we agree that science is falsifiability. A good scientific theory is like Neo from the Matrix. Not technically immortal, but really hard to kill. Here's an example. If I suggest that all swans are white, I have to try to devise an experiment that proves my hypothesis wrong, which means I have to go look for a non-white swan. The reason for this focus upon falsifiability stems from other epistemological issues such as confirmation bias, which would have me just simply go look for white swans and ignore anything that's not a white swan, and conclude they're all white, because that's all I saw. It also helps us avoid issues regarding sampling size. If I go see five white swans, does that mean they're all white? What if I see 45,000 white swans? The only way to sidestep these issues is to try to undermine the base premise that they're all white. If I can do that, and I can prove the claim wrong, it doesn't matter if I find one or one million swans that are non-white, it's game over for the hypothesis. Similarly, if I look in New Zealand and I never see a non-white swan, I didn't prove that all swans are white. The best I can say is that my hypothesis stood up to one test. But if other researchers check out Nova Scotia and Argentina and Burkina Faso and likewise find only white swans, then my theory that all swans are white now has some traction. But remember, it only takes finding one non-white swan anywhere in the world to immediately falsify my hypothesis, rendering all the data prior mere lucky draws. So those black swans in Australia do indeed falsify that hypothesis. The scientific method works this way for several reasons. First, it is empirical, meaning it deals with data derived from the senses, rather than a priori evidence which is usually used in abstract bodies of knowledge like mathematical theory or formal logic. The second reason the scientific method works this way is because of a problem of certainty in epistemology. Basically, the problem of certainty asks whether certainty is a condition of knowledge, 
And if so, how can we be certain when there is always a chance, however slim, that we might be mistaken? If certainty means 0% chance of ever having made a mistake, and knowledge is something possessed by a human brain, which is definitely capable of making a mistake, then something has got to give. And either certainty is impossible, or knowledge is impossible. Most philosophers of science take the former position in what is known as fallibilism. This simply means that any belief we have, despite the evidence gathered, might be misguided or mistaken, and as a result, we should always be open to new data, which might strengthen or falsify our beliefs. In other words, we should always be open to the possibility that there's a black swan out there, even though we've never seen one. So there's no such thing as settled science. By the definition of science, the conclusions derived from any given scientific paradigm are fallible and never settled. Therefore, it's not crazy for a person to question if the Earth is flat. They're simply looking for the black swan, which would falsify the globular hypothesis. Now, that doesn't mean that there actually is such a black swan and that the flat Earth theorists are going to suddenly disprove the globular model. It just means their endeavor is justified via a strict interpretation of what science is. Where flat earthers begin to fail in their methodology, however, is with a strict interpretation of empiricism. Flat earthers use, whether they know it or not, a method of inquiry called the Zetetic Method, which is a formal name for the complete inversion of the scientific method. Where a good scientist should formulate a hypothesis and then try to prove it wrong, somebody following the Zetetic Method would ask a question, gather data, and then interpret the data. On its face, there's a benefit to this method, whereby the narrow confines of a hypothesis and the preconceived biases that derive that hypothesis can be brushed aside and one can start with a clean slate. But one of the preeminent drawbacks is that the data doesn't always paint the clearest picture, and certain conclusions can be drawn that have no means by which they can be falsified. For example, I might question what causes cars to move down the highway. I could gather the data that people are in them and that cars have an internal combustion engine and I could conclude that people are able to make internal combustion engines run by simply asking them to. I know a lot of people are going to point out the obvious flaws in that example, but this segues into the second issue with this method, which is that it's only reliable if you believe that you have gathered 100% of the possible data that could ever be gathered, because otherwise you fall back into a fallibilist position in which you must admit there's more data out there, and it might prove you're wrong. If you stopped before I gave the second criticism, you'd call me an idiot and say, part of the data includes the gas pedal. It includes the person's foot pressing on the gas pedal. It includes the gasoline and the mechanics of steering a steering wheel with one's arms. These are all data points you ignored. But perhaps they're simply data points I wasn't able to get. This notion that simply gathering data and then interpreting it can give us a more accurate picture than shooting down educated guesses in a process of elimination is a very pressing issue because we face it every single day with questions we've been asking for thousands of years. Despite all the evidence gathered, there's no clear answer to what the meaning of life is. There's no clear answer to whether or not there is an afterlife. There's no clear answer on how to cure cancer. And apparently there's no clear answer on what shape the earth is. We have a bunch of data on these issues but we don't know how to interpret it. When we have so much data, we have to try to stick some of it together in a hypothesis, and when it ends up not sticking together, we call that a falsified hypothesis. In everyday life, the scientific method is the basis of all human action. I don't ask what will happen if I put my foot in front of me, shift my weight onto it, and then try again with the other foot. I first suspect that I can take a step if I do this. I test it out with the aforementioned experiment, and I see if my hypothesis holds weight, pun intended. As a result, the question of whether the Earth is flat must be examined like any other question, and that's by formulating a falsifiable hypothesis and then gathering data and seeing if the data disproves the hypothesis. Flat Earth theory is very fun as an epistemological thought experiment because it shows us the limits of strict empiricism. It is true, I don't feel a spinning earth. 
I don't see a globe, and I don't feel the force of gravity. If we were to be strict empiricists, we'd have to conclude that the Earth is flat. But we'd also have to conclude that the world disappears when I cease looking at it, as some philosophers in history definitely have concluded. This is the logical conclusion of too strict empiricism. But empiricism filtered through the scientific method, nuanced with philosophical pragmatism, and taken with a heavy dose of epistemic fallibilism can help us navigate the overwhelming amounts of data we receive every second of every day. Thank you for watching. Please comment in the comments section below. And don't forget to like this video, share it to your social media, and subscribe to the channel. No one men see, neither that are everyone else's.